started to. Okay, let's um, let's come back here. Boom. Okay, I often change the lecture stuff right before class, but uh, that, that's that. Okay, um, let's start off with. Are there any questions about? Um, let's start out anything from. Um, first of all, the material from last time. We've been talking about portfolio theory and the capital assets pricing model. And in principle, that gives us a way to um, sort of design sets of stocks that, uh, collections of stocks with certain properties, namely the best possible risk for a certain return for a certain amount of risk or the lowest risk for a certain amount of return. And um, any questions about that theory? It's actually, I think, an interesting thing. We so, saw so some interesting things there. Any questions? Um, the other thing I, I wanted to say was a little bit about the homework. So homework two uh, was starting to be on the uh, experiments for you coming up with your own trading strategies. Has anybody here successfully run, played with it, and run, for example, the strategy where you don't actually buy any stocks? That was my hope. You would, yes. What? Okay. So what happened when you did this? So you, you, you. you Okay, so that's a good that's a good point then to discuss it. Um, let's see. Uh, the the hope is that each one of those lines, first of all, should be associated with a month. Was there evidence that that was true? When you saw all these lines of output, was there one line of output per month, or you didn't see any evidence of that? Okay, so let, let's go back. Are you are saying, were these on the website or these when you ran something? Okay, so let me just take a look at this because I want to, I, I do want to get in there since I, since I was so successful with the web browser a minute ago. Let's try this again. Okay, and if this doesn't work easily, I want us to, uh, we'll move on and then we'll, we'll talk more about it next class. Okay, the reason is because that's my, not my name. Oh, it's busy. You're no longer. It's going to work. Okay. Yes, I guess that's what you are here, right? Bingo. Okay, so what is an example of a sample input file? Hopefully, this is a sample input file. Your program is supposed to produce things like this, okay? Your, your, uh, your, your program that is, your trading strategy is going to say buy something or sell something. It's going to say how many shares do you want to buy or sell? And it's going to say what is the security that you want to buy or sell, okay? These are presumably the stock ticker symbol names which you have data for. This says what date were you buying? And it looks like this was October 1st, 1998. And it said that you were buying this. You have a choice for each. We gave you time series telling you the opening and closing prices every day. So you get a choice of buying at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. And this is saying you're buying at the open. These you are buying at the close. These you are selling. Okay. And so your job is to produce a strategy, a, a, a bunch of things to do, like this. These were produced by some random strategy, okay, randomly buying and selling, okay? So that's an example, a simple one. Perhaps there are smarter ones for you to play with, okay? 
Any questions about what the input file is? The output file, which I'll admit is a little bit messy, but I think we, you're supposed to look at and understand, okay, is looking something like this. This is what happens when you feed um, your buy and sell orders to our all and powerful simulator. Okay, where we were basing it on the, you know, you gave it a file with the stock prices for which that trading strategy was relevant. Okay, this says to you, this is a year, month, day. This is saying that as of each month, it's giving you something about what was your store, telling you various information about what you returned that month. So this says, here was the day. This says how many shares of stock and, uh, uh, okay, date. It looks like the, um, how many, uh, let's just think about what, what it actually is. My guess is this is, if I interpret the, the uh, values up top right, okay, the captions may not be right, but let's think what this probably is, okay? There are issues of uh, your number of trades, the uh, cash on hand, remember you're going to have money that starts out at a bank, every one of you started out with a million dollars if I'm correct, okay? Don't spend it all in one place. But uh, you start out with one million dollars. There is a uh, question here of what is the value of the stock? How much are you short? Okay? Because remember, you're allowed to sell things short. Okay? There are the questions of what your returns are. So these are supposed to be giving you parameters for each day's, um, each day's uh, you know, what, what is the sum performance of your month for that strategy? Okay? I'm at the moment a little suspicious about whether the captions are, are right. Okay? But what I would encourage you to do is to run a very simple trading strategy, one that you know sort of what should happen, like buying nothing and seeing what happens and see whether the values make sense and start playing with it. I will go try to remember to check what the captions are in each one of these things. But the basic visions are that, that some of these are going to be representing, um, you, know, uh, re you know, amounts of returns, and some of them are going to be representing amounts of shares and stuff like that. So this is what's supposed to be telling you what the, uh, what the performance of your strategy is. Okay? How many people, is there anybody here who successfully wrote a buy nothing strategy and run it through the simulator. You did. Did you get results, a results file that made sense to you? Okay, it's important you look at the, the whole point ultimately is to look at the results, right? But you're telling me you wrote something that made no, no trades. Did you run it through the simulator? Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't complain, it didn't crash or anything. Okay, so that's a good thing, but you should also look at what the numbers are, okay? And if the numbers don't make sense as of next class, people had better holler because um, we're going to want to make sense so that we're evolving towards something that, that, that we understand, okay? So I encourage you to, to, to start out. I will go double-check it to make sure that the caption values are right and get a better, um, a better sense of that just to make sure we understand what the cap, cap put files are. But, but it's important that you guys start to run things through and see some designs. Any other questions about the assignment? How many people successfully started something? I heard, well, I heard some, how many people who started something? Okay. Any other questions about the assignment? Your job is to read the matrix of prices and companies. Your job is to produce a pattern of buys and sells according to a well-founded strategy. And your job is to run that through the simulator and, based on the results of your trades, produce some kind of an insight of how well the trade, the strategy is working. Okay? It would not surprise me if the, the right thing that you're going to want to do is graph, for example, one of these columns, which is probably going to be measuring the returns of those strategies. Okay? Any questions about the assignment? Okay? So I do encourage people to... Um, Get started playing on it because if this is if we wait till too long, there's going to be there's going to be problems that are emerging and there won't be people be able. I don't have time to correct them. Any questions? 
Okay. Any other questions about the market or strategies? Okay. So what I'd like to talk about now is, uh, as far as the lecture today, I'd like to talk about, um, again, we've been talking a little bit about trading strategies. We talked about portfolio theory last time. There's one other sort of, you know, there's some things that when people talk about trading strategies, there's some things that are clearly ma well founded and mathematically rigorous, and there's other things that are, are let's say, less so. And um, today I'd like to talk about, uh, first, about a very important idea that you hear people talk about, something called the efficient market hypothesis. The efficient market hypothesis is a statement. When you say it's a hypothesis, it's something that I guess people call it, would call a theory. It's something you can't quite prove, or it may be a philo philosophical thing. But anyway, it's that the efficient market process states that the price of a financial asset reflects all available public information, okay, and responds only to unexpected news. Okay, now why might this be true? The argument is that if you have a um, heavily traded stock where there are thousands or millions of people eagerly, desperately seeking to, um, to you know, profit from anything that is mispriced about this, okay, and that you have hundreds of hedge funds around the world with P programs that are constantly monitoring what is going on. If there was some kind of an R R thing that was mispriced, where it was it was cost less than it should, or cost people would these people would buy it and the price would go up, or if it was priced more than it should, the price you know uh, people would would sell it short and the price would go down. Okay, that somehow um, that if we believe this then um, prices are somehow considered to be the optimal investment estimates of what an investment is worth at any given time, if you believe that. Okay? If you believe this, then it's impossible to predict whether or not um, prices will move up or down. Okay? And if you say, can you sort of look at a stock and say, this stock is going to go up, the argument would be, if you believe this, that the market is efficient, then the answer would be no, and you shouldn't try. Now, the question of how much do people believe that the market is efficient, or who believes that the market is efficient, okay? This gets into, you know, this gets into a, uh, a let's say, whole philosophical and academic argument. So, um, you know, there, there are a bunch of people who will say, well, you know, the market can't be efficient because I, I make money when I trade, okay? And, of course, that's often not tested very rigorously. That's, um, you know... But anyways, so, so, so in general, people talk about the efficient market hypothesis. There are often a variety of different, let's say, formulations of what this can be. The one that I once heard that I think is computationally interesting, although probably not really, is you might say that prices are predictable, but the problem of computing whether a, what a price is is too hard to compute, okay? And then, therefore, uh, they are effectively unpredictable. Bottom line is that if you accept the efficient market hypothesis as either a, uh, a, the truth or as something that is believed by enough people that it is worthy of respect, it focuses attention on certain things you should or should not be doing. Okay? For one thing, it would say that if you believe the efficient market hypothesis, you don't spend your time trying to identify the best stock. And you instead worry about things like designing portfolios the way we talked about last time. Um, if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, things like technical analysis, which is what we'll talk about today, would be worthless, okay? Because uh, uh, we'll talk about technical analysis, but basically it's an argument that you can predict future price movements based on past movements, okay? If you could do that, th that, 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 is, that is at, um, you know, let's say a, a concept that is... Uh, philosophically opposed to believing in the efficient market hypothesis. The, if you understand what we mean by the efficient market hypothesis, it makes clear why there is a distinction between public and private information. Okay? So that, um, you know, the efficient market hypothesis says that so long as all the information is out there, then somehow the public will consume it and use that to properly set prices. Insider information 
is something where if I go to a company, if I'm, let's say, the president of the company, and I recognize that the vice president has just run off with all of our money, okay, it would be a good, I know it would be a good time for me to sell all my stocks, but it would be considered to be an insider trade. It's illegal somehow for people with inside knowledge of a company to sort of trade, at least in the United States, at least in certain highly regulated markets. And the reason is because there is this difference between insider information that only certain people can know, okay, and outside information, okay, which everybody can know, which you can somehow digest if you're smarter in theory. You can digest and find the right thing. Any questions about that? You know, the, the, this notion of insider trading is an interesting thing. I don't know how the rules here are. I don't know if anyone knows the rules here. I don't know how stringent they are about insider trading or not. In the United States, they are very s stringent. Um, so, for example, I remember once visiting a company in the biotech sector. You know, I was doing some, you know, I do some work on, on sequencing. And I was visiting a company that was doing sequencing technology. And um, they were describing to me how, how great their uh, sequencing technology I said, is. I said, wow, it is a great stock to buy. And every one of them said, no, 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 we can't do that. You didn't say that. And why is that? because somehow that there's laws about what they can say and what is an insider could do. Now that I had seen stuff inside the company, they made me sign a sheet that I can't buy or sell the stock because now I was an insider, okay? Any questions? And the news today that I read this morning, which kind of warmed my heart a little bit, there was a, uh, in the United States, there is a fairly abrasive internet billionaire from who made his money in the internet boom and uh, sold out in time. And so he had a lot of rich wealth, and he buys a lot of sports teams and stuff like that. And he apparently um, was visiting inside some company that he owned. And uh, he was given some private information about it, the story goes, that he wasn't allowed to tell or disclose. And four hours later, sold his entire share of wealth in the company. And so the Security Exchange Commission went after him, okay, because he was using insider information, okay, and, you know, and so... Whether he'll, get, whether he'll get in trouble or not is not, not clear yet. But well, I mean, it's clear he's, he's in a certain amount of trouble. But that's because acting on um, inside information is considered to be illegal you know, in certain ways. Any questions about that? OK. So um, OK. With respect to the efficient market hypothesis, again, the idea that somehow if we say that prices are, it, it is hopeless to try to, to, to predict these things. Well. Um, it's a simple model, okay, and perhaps it's too simple, and perhaps there are things you can do on the edge, okay? But on the other hand, it's something that we should respect. And so if you have a strategy that you think is arguing against the efficient market hypothesis, the onus is sort of on you to prove it. Any questions? Okay, that said, I'd like to talk now about something that shouldn't work if we believe in the efficient market hypothesis which is uh, technical analysis. And the reason we're going to talk about it is, one, is something that uh, people find interesting. There's no question people find it interesting. A lot of people use it. Several people in the class have talked to me, oh, for my project, I want to study this. I want to simulate it, OK? I want to program it up. Because there's going to be a certain amount of program strategies here that as computer scientists, you look at and say, yeah, I can write a program to recognize that, OK? And it becomes an interesting thing. But so I, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the academic literature on technical analysis, what some of the ideas are or measures are. And um, you know, just, I think it's worth, it's worth a class period to talk about it. So what do we mean by technical analysis? We mean a uh, class of investment strategies that look at past time series behavior, past pricing behavior, and tries to make future predictions on it. Okay? And um, if you look at, let's say, what the assumptions are of technical analysis, I got from this, this book a list of assumptions, many of which are reasonable. Okay? The argument would be that the market value of a company is placed, determined solely by supply and demand. And that's certainly true. The price of a stock is dependent upon what people are willing to pay for the stock and not. So that I agree with says that stock prices tend to move in trends 
that persist for long periods of time. I think that that is clearly true, okay? That we've seen a world where stock prices went up for a while, haven't gone up recently. They've gone down fairly consistently. So certainly it looks like that there are things like trends in the world, okay? Shift in supply and demand cause reversals of trends. And that, I think, is very obvious. Okay, we've just lived in a world where the world, you know, where in a time when it, when it looked, the market looked very good, everybody wanted to buy stocks or housing or something like that. Suddenly, there, there is less demand, the prices are dropped, uh, dropped, there's a reversal in trend. The next claim is that these shifts can be detected by graphs or charts. And to a certain extent, this may seem obvious. You know, if I give you a graph like this, can anybody report to me what the trends were in this? Okay, does anybody see evidence that there was an upward trend followed by a downward trend? Okay, I think most people would agree with that. Okay, now the question, so, so I think that, that, that it is probably true, I think it's obviously true that certain patterns and trends reveal themselves on graphs or charts. Any questions about that? Now the tricky part of course starts to be is if you start to see now this. Here we saw a bump where it went up. Was this a reversal of trend or was this the, um, you know, was this representing a reversal of trend or is that a temporary fluctuation? In the hindsight, when you look at the chart, it's pretty clear that it was a temporary fluctuation. But is it clear that when you looked over here, was it a temporary fluctuation that it was going down? At what point did the trend really set in? Okay? And that's probably the harder issue here. So the question of can you detect them? By looking at the graph afterwards, I would say yes, you can define them. Okay? Any questions? But these make sense. Then the final claim is that many chart patterns tend to repeat themselves. Okay, that things go up and things go down. Okay, things go up, down, up, down, up, or something like this. And this I don't know any particular reason. This is a, the claim that I would say is fishy sounding. I don't see any particular reason why that has to be. Okay, but the claim would be that if there are chart patterns that tend to repeat themselves, then if you could recognize these patterns, you would be able to get an edge as to what's going on. Any questions? And so there's a certain amount of debate here about whether these kind of technical strategies work, okay, or whether um, something like fundamental analysis, where you look at actually the balance sheet of companies, would be a proper way to trade. Or if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, the right thing to do is not to bother, because you can't predict these things, okay? Any questions? So what are the arguments that I would say are in favor and against this idea of technical analysis? Where you look at the pattern you've seen and try to, to, to use that to predict what future traders are. One argument is that it is widely used by both professionals and amateurs. And the argument would be if you have a professional who's in this business, why would they, would they use something if it didn't work? Okay, and there are various studies that are, have to do with, um, with where, uh, you know, people with, that, that argue that, that, that if you interview traders and say what, what, what do they use, a large number of them will use technical analysis. Again, this was a, a paper that I read having to do with currency trading. And currency trading we haven't talked about, but if your business is to trade between dollars and yen all day, and that's basically what these guys probably do. You have a guy who's sitting there looking at one number, okay, and they have to move monies between dollars and yen all day trying to get as much of an edge or that, that, that they can, then this is exactly the kind of thing where in some sense a large part of all they have to look at is the pattern of past or recent price movements. Okay? And the argument is a lot of these people use it. Maybe a more, a more interesting argument, saying that a lot of people do something doesn't make it right. That's what I tell my children. Okay? So another argument for it might be that market prices, we certainly agree, reflect supply and demand. And if people, if the rest of the world out there 
is using one's trading strategy. It's important to understand what that strategy is. Perhaps it's important to understand because if everyone but you is using this trading strategy, then probably you should be using it, okay? Because they're going to drive the market in a particular way. Or if a bunch of people are using it, maybe not, you know, maybe it's important to use so you can maybe bet against it. If you have a bunch of people irrationally pricing something too high, okay, because of some recent pattern, perhaps it pays to know about that pattern. Maybe it's good to go contrarian to that, okay? So there's an argument that that's been an argument for knowing that if people are doing something, if everybody is doing it, whether it made any sense or not, that then would be a phenomena that would, would cause certain effects. Okay? And so that's another reason why technical analysis might be interesting. Um, many, uh, you know, there's arguments to say that although the market may be efficient, we've talked here about how there are several different kinds of traders. There are people who are seeking arbitrage opportunities. And there's people who are looking to hedge their risks. And the other one is the speculators. And the argument would be that if you've got some people who are not as interested in making returns on what they're doing, like for example, people who are hedging risk, the argument would be that the people who are trading with the people who are hedging risk, arguably, some, if someone is trying to hedge their risk, they're not looking to make as much of a profit. The argument might be that by trading with them, there is some room to do something, some possible edge you can gain. Okay? Any questions about that? And the final thing is that if you look at certain of the technical strategies, they tend to mirror um, natural trait human strategies. Like a lot of people, when the stock goes up, when it breaks through a high, they say, go and buy. Okay? Well, that's certainly people's instinct. Okay? Or when, it's, go, when, it's, when the prices are dropping, you should sell. That seems to be what everybody is doing now. Okay? And so the argument would be that these seem to make some sense. So maybe that's an argument that the, the strategies are, are valuable. Any questions? The arguments against it, I, there was a quote that I really liked, which said that technical analysis is like driving a car while looking through the rear view mirror. Okay? If you think about it, if you're trying to figure out what, what is a, a price is going to do, Technical analysis says, look at past prices, and then they will tell you that that's, that's what you should be doing. And it's like, look, brilliant. if you look at a car, if you're trying to figure out how to drive a car, if you're looking behind you, it's not going to prevent you from bumping into a tree or anything like that. Um, again, if we talked about the idea that if prices are random walks, then, or if the market is efficient, if it's a random walk, that it's a random walk and there's nothing you can predict. If you believe that the complete knowledge, the market is efficient, the complete knowledge of past history is encoded in the current price. And if that's so, then there is no information there that you have that somebody else does not have, no matter what magic trading scheme, technical scheme you use. Okay? Any questions? There is another argument that when you start to read about some of these strategies and these patterns people look for, these patterns tend to be very, fairly ambiguous, okay? You know, like you'll say, well, you know, sell when you, when, when your hit go below the support level. And the question of what it means to be a support level is somewhat ill-defined, and different people can come up with different definitions. So you could have two people, in my mind, who can be taking the same Following the same theory, if you say, yes, I believe in technical indicators, yes, I believe in this, and yet they might very well do different things because there's a certain amount of slop in the definitions. And this makes it very hard to, to identify whether a theory or an idea is good or not. Okay? Any questions? If you've got a, a clearly rigorous, well-defined procedure, it is not hard to take a rigorous, well-defined procedure implement it as you are going to do on this homework assignment and then run it through a simulator and back test it and see what it did. On the other hand, if you take a vague philosophical statement, there's lots of ways it can be implemented and it's hard to argue one is different than the other. Any questions? Um, that said, again, when people have short-term 
claims. You know, it, it, it's, it's the case that short-term claims, like, oh, I ran it for a, a month and I've made a lot of money, that's a meaningless statement because you need some kind of a statistical validity to it. There are published studies, a lot of published studies, in the academic literature about how, um, to what extent, technical analysis works or doesn't work. And I'll talk about one at the end of class. In general, many, many of them say that there is some signal in techni these technical analysis things, okay? But they'll tend to differ to what degree, or, but, and they're somewhat ambiguous. Some say they work, some say they don't work, okay? Any questions here? Okay? Fair enough. So what I'd like to do for most of the rest of the class is talk a little bit about some of the kind of patterns and things and indicators people use. Because, um, first of all, if you go to a trading terminal, if you look at a Bloomberg box or, I guess, the Reuters thing, undoubtedly there are, is a place there where it will say compute certain technical indicators, okay? Because traders are interested in many of these I indicators. And many of them are interesting ideas. Some of them are, in my mind, complete balderdash, complete ridiculous. Some of them do measure interesting phenomena that, that might make sense okay, as, as, um, as indicators of something that's going on in the market. Okay? Whether it's future prices is another question. But, um, so when people talk about these things, they talk about charts. And um, typically, you, know, um, you often see these kind of candlestick charts or bar charts, okay, which will show you every day what was the high or low, what was the trading range that a stock traded on? And um, perhaps they augment the trading range where you show the uh, opening and closing price as defining a, heavily, a heavy bar and the uh, high and low as being a thin bar. And what's kind of neat, you now get a pattern that looks a little bit like a candlestick. That's, I guess, why they would argue this kind of thing. And what's kind of interesting is a visualization thing. This is a neat representation of four numbers in a relatively small amount of space. So if you remember, we were talking about visualization. These sort of candlestick charts provide a way to keep track of four different numbers in ways that you can visualize certain things. One question is, were the high and low reached at the beginning or the end of the day? That's one thing that you would be able to tell by whether or not this block is, the, the inner bar is up near the top or near the bottom. Is the inner bar thinner or thicker than it usually is? There's certain patterns like that that would reveal, okay. In, in this the one, there seems to be no way to know what is the open or what the close is, okay. So it's an argument, actually what's interesting here is you do not get a sense of what the open and the close is. Okay? So that's one piece of information that is lost with this representation. Okay? You could probably augment it in some way by putting a little O or a C or something like that. But, but that is a piece of information that is lost in this visualization. Any questions? Okay? You might be able to make some guesses by comparing one bar's price to the next. Okay? That uh, if I was taking a look at this day here, for example, um, I would have to say that if I were to take a guess what was most likely the situation, this must have been the open, this must have been the close, this must have been the open, this must have been the close. But I have no firm, just because um, at the, the, the nearest time on here is going to represent one of, anyway, there could be a sense that somehow that the close one day is close to the open the next day. That would be one argument that probably is true, or in principle should be true. But I agree with you, the information is lost. Yes? I think the color will represent the information. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that now you're going to color them. Yeah, like the one is black and one is white. That would be a way you might be able to show that. Let's say, let's say, that, that, let's say that, that, that that's a, that's a reasonable way to encode it. But it's clear you would need more information. So it says how well I read my slide today. Okay? So that would be an argument that you could tell these things. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Um, an up day or a down? Right. Uh, right. Okay. So let's say I agree with that. 
Okay? And um, there's certain trading systems which look for patterns in these bars. Okay? Uh, again, in my mind, these, these candlestick plots and things like that are a nice visualization tool. And they let you see something about mar recent market activity. The question of what patterns hold for these charts are, are less clear to me. But it seems clear that it's an interesting um, visualization thing. Any questions? There are a class of um, trading technical tr trading strategies which revolve around how the current price ref um, reflects to recent history. So um, people talk about the support level as the uh, lower end of its recent trading range. So if we have a stock price, let's just say it's doing something like this. they would argue something to the effect that the support level is probably something like this, okay? That it's something about a recent lower bound, okay? And um, there would also be a resistance level, which would be some kind of a recent upper bound. And the people here will argue that if you get slightly near the, you know, that somehow stock prices tend to crawl, but they don't like to get past their recent high. And so likely, uh, you know, they often will bounce around their support level. And they don't like to fall below their recent low. Okay? To what extent that's true or not is unclear. But it should be clear, how do you define what the support level is? What is the logical, let's say, limit as to what the recent lower bound is? It depends something about how you define what the end of recent is. And it depends upon how many, how much stuff you, you know, is something that went up and down. Like this, is this a support level? How long do you have to be roughly there? Should be clear these are somewhat ad hoc things that you have to define. Any questions? Before you can actually code this up, you have to define what it means to be a support level. Any questions? Okay, but the argument would be that uh, that depending upon you should buy when when a price is near its support level, okay, because it's not going to go below it, and you should sell when it's near its uh, resistance level. Any questions? Um, perhaps there is a, a more sophisticated class of these kind of things that will factor in not only the um, the price trends, but we'll also look at how much people are selling here. Notice that um, suppose we had a world where there was, suppose we open up the uh, market at one in the morning someday, okay, now, you know, when everybody's asleep. And there's one guy who absolutely has to sell his shares, okay? There's a, you know, a guy in it holding a gun to his head. You have to sell your Yahoo shares now. And there's only one other trader in the world who's awake who didn't particularly want to buy Yahoo shares. But if the price keeps dropping enough, eventually they would do it. Okay? So sometimes there is a price change where the price, in this case, the guy would, would, would the price would drop a lot and there would be very little volume that was traded. Right? This is one guy who was selling. Um, that may or may not be as, in, as big an indicator of something as if there was a lot of people, a lot of trades involved in a sell. Okay? So somehow you can measure somehow some combination of our prices going up or down. Link that into something with volume to think whether or not people are, um, you know, are, are what, what people are really thinking. If most people are sitting on the sidelines, most people aren't really thinking. But if the prices are dropping, okay, and if they're dropping with a high volume, that means everybody is saying get away from this market, okay? And so one would argue that a combination of that might be significant. Any questions? I think that's plausible. Um, the other thing that there is some academic literature on is showing that there tend to be, um, I won't say sort of cycles, okay, or periodicities or corrections to sharp reactions, okay? So in general, if you have a stock that drops one, uh, by a large amount one week, 
it tends to go up by a lot the week after. Okay? And I think we've seen that a little bit in the market that's been doing all the crazy things these days. There has been a lot of volatility. Volatility means that every day it drops by 10%. The next day it goes up by 5% or something like this. Okay? And there seems to be some statistical evidence that that happens. Now, the reason why that might happen, that's sort of an example of what you would call overreaction. People may tend to overreact to news. Okay? And if so, then you would expect to have corrections a little bit later after sudden movements. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? And the other question, though, is if you picture that the market is trying to price something, here's sort of another philosophical way to look at it. If you're trying to find out what the right price of something is, when you studied, let's say, in calculus, you did Taylor series or any other kind of approximation, typically you're adding terms that tend to offset each other as you hone in on an approximation. You might imagine an approximation strategy where you approximate it like this, or you approximate it like this. There seems some evidence that the market approximates things okay, by, um, by overreacting and then correcting. Any questions? There is another class of what I would like to say are interesting indicators based on um, moving average ideas, okay? So we have talked about, uh, about these exponentially weighted moving averages where you will take a, uh, you know, if you have a, these are the current price movements. You can compute a value of what is the smooth value of recent price movements perhaps by averaging over a fixed window. Let's say that today's average is going to be the average of the seven days before it. And you're going to have a, a, a function that is the, the moving average, okay, where everything was weighted uniformly. Or perhaps you can have an, a weighted average where you weight recent terms more. But bottom line is, um, with a moving average kind of a function, you take a set of discrete price points and you can carve that up into a function that sort of approximates the recent movements. If you average over a large range, it's going to react more slowly to changes in prices. If you average over a short window, it's going to react more quickly but be more irregular. Okay? Any questions? So there are a certain um, class of what we would call technical indicators where they define a sort of moving average function for how the market seems to be moving and then define bands around it based on what they think is the range in trading that would be natural given the current, um, given the current let's say, prices. Okay. So when we talk about a band, I'll show you some examples of these things here. These methods will be defined by some kind of a smooth function of what current prices are, some measure of how irregular are things now, perhaps a function of volatility, perhaps a function of recent highs and lows, okay? And say that movements will be either in these bands or not in these bands. Okay? Any questions? So here's an example of one, of one class of these things. So they call them Bollinger Bands. But what these are saying here is, take the stock prices, and here is the stock prices movements in black. Compute a 20-day moving average of it. Okay? So here the market was going up. Our average is going to be lagging it because we're basing it based on back ranges. Here the price dropped. Our average is lagging it. Okay. So the blue line represents, let's say, a 20-day moving average of the prices. The red lines here are representing somehow a confidence interval or a trading range or upper and lower bounds based on volatility, okay? So we talk about the standard deviation of price movements as measuring volatility. If everything was normally defined, 
being one standard deviation away, you know, if, if, if things were normal, there's a probability of being outside, okay, a, a certain number of, of standard deviations outside a trading rate, outside your current position, okay, and that within one standard deviation is something like about 66% probability. Within two standard deviations is like a 95% probability. So the argument here is you can define a band based on recent volatility and then observe whether or not the price gets outside of that range. If it does, that is an unusual thing. And an unusual thing is probably something to note. Any questions? Again, the argument would be if you have a band like this, Sometimes the bands will get narrower. Times that they get narrower is when there is less volatility. Sometimes they get broader. That's at times of greater volatility. So the argument that, uh, by this theory is that uh, the movements in outside the band should continue. That somehow once they have broken free of this shackle, that means that there's something ch changed in their going places. Okay? Movements that go outside and come back in suggest trouble because they're supposed to keep going if they get outside here. If they go back in, that's problem. Okay? If the bands tighten, that's a measure of lower volatility. And that's supposed to indicate something. Okay? Any questions? Okay, yeah. If I got that straight, what it essentially is saying is that if it goes up, it should, if it goes up and it goes outside the band, then it should keep on going up. That's what, that's what they said, yes. And who says it? It's Bollinger says it. So okay. If it's going up, if, it, if, it, if the price movements are strongly up, then it will continue going up. That, yes, that would be the argument that this would be a way of telling when is something seemingly moving more than it should be. And that's not an irrational thing to want to have something light up on your trading screen, right? Who is it in the world that is moving up much more than they should be? Okay? If we assume that there's normal, uh, you know, random movements, it is unusual, and we know how unusual it would be, to be two standard deviations outside of it. So it seemed like, to me, a perfectly reasonable signal where if I was a stock trader, I would not mind getting, you know, a, a bell rung every time somebody, they've, I've detected somebody whose movements are much more than you expect, because that's probably something where something interesting is happening, okay? Again, what, whether the meaning is here, you know, is, is, a, is a question of interpretation. Any questions? So that seems like a natural um, way to define bands. There are other natural ways to define bands. Okay, this is one I kind of liked. Okay, um, they call them Gershon bound bands. Where what they did was it said instead of defining the um, the width of the band based on uh, the recent volatility, what they would say is, look, stock prices are supposed to be, what, what, what tool we have to, to de detect trends is regression. Okay, if I saw stock prices going like this, I could compute the regression line, the most, comp you know, the line that best fits that data. And there is a measure of error based on how much, how, how well or badly did those points, did this regression line approximate the movement of that data, of, the, of, those, uh, of those points. So here's a regression line for through those points. It will be unchanged if I add points up here. Okay? What will change is the error, not the regression line itself. And so the argument here is, that if you take a recent window, you can compute over that recent window what was the regression line. Based on that, you can compute what was the error in the prediction of that regression line. If we come to a point where there, where, where there is more error, we're going to widen our bands. If not, we won't. So here is an example of a graphic where this is done. If you look at the price signal here, here, the price seems to be going down, down, down in a nice linear way. The band, the error bands are pretty small. Here, it suddenly jumps up. 
The predictions, if we believed in the linear regression, would have been it should be down here. The error is now that big, okay? That causes us to now have a much larger error band. Because now the, the regression line, the optimum regression line is still going to be here for a while. Okay? And then it becomes tricky to figure out what it should be. The error is going to grow. Okay? And so this is another reasonable way of generating bands. Any questions about it? And again, anything that moves beyond this is probably interesting. Or in this case, when the, when the, um, when the bands widen is an interesting thing. Any questions? Um, certain other classes of models, uh, they call convergence or divergence models. We'll take a look at moving averages from one period, let's say 26 days, and compare them to moving averages over, in this case, a shorter period. Now, if you have a situation where the moving average for t uh, recently is going like this, the moving average over a 26-day period is going up like that, but the moving average of a, over a 13-day period is going up like this, the 13-day period is going to adjust more to um, recent trends. And the difference between the 13-day moving average and the 26-day moving average would be reflecting something about how is the recent trend recently changing. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, why 13 and 26? Does anybody know? Because they say it's 13 and 26. Okay. It's an arbitrary constant. Okay. And it's why the theories like this are why one might be suspicious. A lot of these like, things sound like interesting ideas. They do capture and predict things. Or they capture some kind of an idea, some ability to detect some phenomena. Okay. The important thing to recognize is that there is a lot of numerology and, uh, let's say, decisions that go into these things, okay? And they're not written in stone. Any questions? Which, which one is better? I mean, the and well, it depends better for what. I will talk at the end about what is... No, so now how do you... Dis uh, we'll talk a little bit about what does literature say about technical indicators in general at the end, Okay. And so, do I have any particular one of these? Do I know which one is better? The answer is, I see no reason why one is better than the other. Okay? There are things you may believe on philosophically based on something. It is probably an interesting thing in this case to try to study which bands predict better. Okay? But, um, but such experiments are surprisingly complicated. This is the kind of experiment that would be a good project, for example. Okay? It is the kind of thing that if you read journals of the Journal of Finance and things like that, there are well-defined studies of issues like this, okay? And, you know, the question is, if you believe in the, um, hidden mar in the uh, efficient market hypothesis, presumably the answer is neither of them predicts any better. They both predict equally well, which is not at all, okay? Any questions? There are other classes of, um, of uh, these things that they call money flow oscillators, or an oscillator is something that I guess that goes up and down, okay? A money flow indicator, well, again, it is some way of factoring, and we talked about this idea that price movements are one thing. The volume of money bet on the price movements is another thing, okay? And it would seem to make sense that volume is somewhat of an indicator by itself. Um, so a money flow indicator would try to find some way of com combining the magnitude of a price change and the amount of money invested in it to figure out whether money is going into buying or selling. Okay? So let's think about it. Okay? If we have a stock price that goes down on a day, Okay, are people buying or selling? Okay, if a stock goes down on a day, is that an indication that people are buying or selling? Okay. Is there a sense about that? In one sense, the answer is they're selling because somehow it seems like there's a pressure putting the price down. 
On the other hand, of course, the same amount of you know, the same amount of buying and selling going on, because every time somebody sells, somebody has to buy it, right? So to try to come up with a notion, you can, to figure out how you relate money, the amount of money, the the volume of trading to money is there are a couple of different ways you could think about that. One possibility is they would talk about as a measure, uh, an accumulation or distribution type of a function would be a measure of the volume bought in an up period minus the volume in a down period. Okay? So if we take a look, let's say, over the last week, there have been some days when it went up and some days when it went down. Right? Okay? If we multiply the amount of money, that the volume, by the amount that it went up versus down, we can figure out whether people are trying to get money into a market or money out of a market, right? If on these two days, exactly one person bought stocks, one share was traded, and on these days there were a million shares traded, okay? Money is in principle being moved out of the market, okay? And this would be some way, this idea of somehow uh, measuring that volume, okay? Integrating that volume like this would be one way of measuring whether people are in principle, moving money in or moving money out. Any questions? And that seems like a natural thing to want to worry about. Okay? Any questions? Again, there's lots of these different um, kinds of ideas that can be done. Um, one other thing, um, you know, I look at this indicator. Here's another indicator I found kind of appealing. One that would compare the gains on up days versus the losses on down days, okay? So you can take a look at this and say, well, is the sum of the up days bigger than the sum on the down days, okay? Or how many up days are there versus down days? You could imagine a world where there's a market where it looks like this, little bit up, little bit up, little bit up every day, and one day when it plunges, okay? That is a different shaped signal than one where it did this, even if it ended up in the same place. And so some people would believe that maybe it makes a sense to see, is there, you know, how many up days versus down days, independent of what the magnitudes are, to suggest something about what people are thinking. Any, any questions about that? Seems like another, you know, reasonable enough idea. Okay? Any questions? Another class of indicators has to do with things like what's happening with a lot of stocks. Okay? So when I would listen to, you know, when I listened to the radio, they would always say the Dow Jones today was up 3.5%, you know, where advancers led decliners 615 to 319. There's a certain number of stocks that went up and a certain number of stocks that went down. Okay? Perhaps one measure of interest is, is the market, you know, are the, if it's going up, is it going up because a few stocks are going up? Okay? Google invents a cure for cancer. Okay? Google would go up. Okay? The rest of the stock might not. Or is it that everybody is going up? And you would probably want some kind of an indicator for that. And that's somehow what this kind of a measurement would be. How broad a rally is it? Okay, or not. Any questions? There are certain classes of what I will call pros versus Joes indicators. Okay, a pro is a someone who supposedly knows what they're doing. A Joe, Joe is a common name in the United States, okay, and it means any person. Okay? So um, one argument would be to see what, what smart people are doing. Okay, if you had a vision, if, the, if you thought that the market was smart people and dumb people, you would probably want to know what are the smart people doing. Okay, and either you'll say, well, if the smart people are smart because they are successful, then you'd want to do what the smart people are doing. Okay, or maybe not. Okay, how can you measure how smart somebody is or what the, the people in the market are thinking? Okay, the smarter people in the market, the more sophisticated ones. One argument might be to look at short selling. 
Okay, shorting stocks is done by more sophisticated investors as opposed to the general investor probably is less likely to short, okay? So one question is, do people, who are people, how much short selling is there in a stock, okay? One interesting indicator here is the ratio of short selling in, in interest to daily volume. When somebody has sold the stock short, there's a certain amount of money in the stock that's been sold short. In principle, that means that we might think that's a bad indicator. If there's a lot of, let's say, a lot of Volkswagen that is sold short, you might think that's a bad thing for Volkswagen, because that means that that a lot of people want to buy, you know, want to sell. Thinks Volkswagen's going to go down. On the other hand, it's also the case that. All these people who have sold Volkswagen short have to buy it back at some point. So another way to think about what short selling might be is an indicator that there is a future demand for it. Okay? And perhaps that will go down. There, you might ask a question of who is doing the short, the short selling. Okay? And, uh, you know, they're sort of the specialists at a stock exchange. The people who sort of work there and have certain um, supposedly higher knowledge. You might say, what are they doing compared to other people? That would be a web measurement, smart versus dumb money. Any questions? There are also other indications of what people are saying or recommending. Okay? So we talked a little bit about insider trading. Okay? Um, you know, in the United States, if you are the president of a company, if you are selling a non-trivial amount of your own stock, you have to tell the Security and Exchange Commission that you're selling it. So if you are a stockholder, let's say you own a Digiscam, and you're looking and you're finding that the president of Digiscam has sold his shares, and the vice president of Digiscam has sold his shares, you might be suspicious that something is happening. It might be they both wanted a vote. Or it might be that both of them know that something inside is happening, okay? And so, although it's illegal to take advantage of real inside information, it is certainly legal if you own shares in a company to sell them. And so, at least in the United States, you are required to, if you're an insider, required to tell the SEC what's going on, okay? And people will monitor this, okay? You might want to take a look at that signal and use that to decide what's happening. If you believe they're selling it because they want a boat, it doesn't mean anything. If you think they're selling it because they think they're deserting a sinking ship, that's a different question. Any questions? And finally, there's other indices that you can compute based on what financial advisors are recommending. Okay? So it could be that, for example, you, you know, every uh, security firm has analysts and they will publish analyst reports saying, I think that Digiscam is a good stock to buy. I have a buy order on Digiscam. I have a hold. I have a sell. Some aggregate collections of information on that are probably interesting. If these advisors know what they're doing, their words should be taken seriously. If they don't know what they're doing, but other people know, are, are listening to them, okay, they should go, you should still take it seriously, okay? Because that's what, in principle, money is going to follow these suggestions. Any questions? So these are other, let's say, areas of inside information that you might be able to have. Okay? Any questions? And there are all kinds of other theories here. Again, the thing that I want to convince you of, I can help people are starting to glaze over. The question is, why are you glazing over? One reason is that there's so many of these different kinds of theories and ideas. Okay? and that many of them sound appealing, and some of them um, don't sound appealing. But suddenly it seems like a harder thing that, that, than you might have thought to look at all these indicators and decide what is the right one to do. Okay? Because there are many of them out there, and they are not well defined. One class of particularly weird technical analysis is involved in something you hear called Elliott Wave Theory. There's a cult of people who believe in this. And the interesting thing as a mathematician is not that the, um, the, the theory seems to be based on anything 
fundamental, but it seems to be based on Fibonacci numbers. Okay? So there are various um, patterns. I don't want to go through the details because it's a, uh, a silly, you know, pro presumably silly thing. But there are people who will look at and say, yes, things go up, but they go up in patterns of fives and threes. Okay? And that somehow, um, if you look at this picture, they'll say, yes, this is how the market should move. And the reason it should move is you have two moves up, then three moves up, and that's a total of five. Two moves down and three moves up, and that's a total of five. And that it will exist in these regular waves of these kind of shapes. And if you believe that, then you look for these patterns, and that's going to tell you something. Um, the thing that's interesting to me about these is, uh, where do we go here? Is that uh, these things, they're often things based on Fibonacci numbers. Fives and threes come from Fibonacci numbers. Whenever you see something that has five and three and eight in it, somehow there's a Fibonacci idea lurking in it. And there are certain phenomena in the world that seem to be linked to Fibonacci numbers. Okay? When you look at a piano, there's 13, there's eight white keys and five black keys in every 13 keys of an octave. Okay? Why is that? Well, it is. Okay? If you look at certain plants, there are certain things that tend to come up, like the number of leaves in certain plants, or flower buds, or always tend to be a Fibonacci number. And there's some, some reasons for why that is. The ratio of successive Fibonacci numbers, the, the nth Fibonacci number over the n minus first, that's what they call the golden ratio. And that's a number that seemingly people have a mystical power about. Okay? It defines a pretty looking rectangle. It seems to come up in a lot of cases. And so a lot of, let's say, viewing platforms, when you want to see, let's say, a, uh, a price series, people may ask for what they will call Fibonacci trend lines, where the normal thing, if it goes, uh, you know, if 50% if, if is the baseline, they look at ratios that are um, the golden ratio, or one minus the golden ratio, as being signs of whether you have gone above it, you know, what above it is interesting and what below it is interesting. Okay? And somehow these tend to be mystical things, numerology, based on Fibonacci numbers. Any questions here? Okay? Much of this is just numerology, not mathematics. Any questions? So what is it that is, that, that, um, people, let's say, academics have looked at about um, technical analysis. If you want to try to draw some conclusions from all this. The best paper that I ever read on this, okay, was something in the Journal of Finance, I believe, okay, uh, which was a study where they looked at essentially every stock they could, every meaningful stock, which came out to be 878, over a long period of time, every day for a 10-year period. And they looked at any technical anal uh, signal they could find, and they came up with 60 of them. Okay? And they then wanted to see which one of these does best. That was the question you asked, right? Which one of these does best? Okay? Or do any of them do best? Okay? And their conclusions are interesting, because they're, you know, there's, there's a certain subtlety in their conclusions that is worth thinking about. The first question is, if you trade by any of these signals, okay, what's interesting is you will do worse than buy and hold. Buy and hold is one of the strategies you're testing on your program, right? That said, buy the stocks and forget about them. Now, they said that um, technical signals, when you trade it on these, okay, in general you will do worse than just with buy and hold. Now, why is that? The reason is, many of these technical indicators spend a lot of time saying that, um, that, that, that the market is going to go down and you should get out. Okay? They have a lot of days when they will say you should be out. And one problem is that if you bet on stocks, in general, historically, stocks have had a positive return over a long term. So if your trading strategy says hold cash instead of stocks. In general, that is a bad thing to do, okay, for long-term returns, okay? 
because somehow there is a you know there is a drift if we want to think of this accumulate this this thing as being a drift there is a positive drift for what stock prices should do okay long term and if you're out of the market then that means you don't get to take advantage of that okay any questions okay one corollary of that if you want to say when are technical indicators good technical indicators will do better than buy and hold if prices are going down well that's not a surprise okay if, if it says basically get out of the market versus staying in by definition when it's going down okay technical indicators seem to be better at saying that well seem to seem to have something to say get out when it's going down okay any questions now, one interesting subtlety here is, although it was bad to follow any one technical indicator, okay, or even any mix of them, the interesting thing was that they did see evidence that the technical indicators contained information that was of value. So they tested 60 different indicators, okay. For 50 out of the 60, okay, they found that they were showed greater returns on the days that they said that. Uh, that um, that you should buy, and on the days that uh, they said to sell, the um, te technical uh, the, on the days that the technical indicator said to sell, the average gain was lower than on other days. Okay, so what's interesting is that they were in some sense reasonably good at telling you what was going to be an up day and what was going to be a down day, okay? And yet, these signals were not strong enough in general to outperform buy and hold. Why is that? Maybe I could tell you that today is going to be a lousy day relative to, if you look at the downs thing here, they found lower than average returns on the days when the indicators said to sell. That's a sign that the indicators were showing something and yet, even though the lower than average returns on those days, the returns on those days were still positive. Note that, again, if we have a world where every day we would expect a positive drift on, uh, you know, if we have a world where this is the long-term trend in the market, what was basically the case that on the days that they said were going to be good, let's say the trend would be something like this, and on the days that the, the market was going to be bad, when they said the market was bad, the, the trend was like this. Thus, there was some level of signal they found. But even though it was a, not going to be as good a day on the market as usual, the net result was still positive, okay? which was an argument that you should have been in the market rather than being out, even though it's going to be less good on average. Any questions about that? That's a, that's a simple point if I explained it right. Uh, and I may I not have to ask. They made, they made the conclusion that from every single indicator, or, uh, uh, what I mean is that if, uh, is that possible? Is that likely that if I use a combination of indicators, then it, it will, the conclusion will not hold? Well, the argument here is that. Um, well, these guys were in principle trying to, you know, they were doing this experiment presumably in the hope of something coming up. And they were presumably behaving like real scientists. So they showed that evidence where the, um, where most of the indicators seemed to be able to show when it was going to be a, a good day, relatively good day, or a relatively bad day. But that is different than whether it's going to be an up day or a down day. Because most days are up days in the long run. Okay? Any questions? Your argument is, well, what if I took these 50 of them and now said that's going to be my new hyper-technical indicator, right? And maybe, okay? Now, the trouble is, let's think what that means. How do you combine these 50? Let's say I now give you 50 signals. How do I combine them? Do I vote? Okay, and say the ones, when, when, on, on the days when these 50, most of them say I'm up, I'm going to be in the market, and otherwise I'll be out. You're presumably going to suffer the same phenomena that you had before. That the more that they tell you to be out, the more likely it is that, that uh, you know, you'll be out on times when it will go up. Any questions? 
So if you want to think about what the meaning of this is, um, if you're going to try to take advantage of technical, uh, a technical indicator, the question of how you manage your portfolio is, is important. We had this world where maybe if we believe these guys study, there is some kind of weak signal on many of these indicators. Now the question is, how do you take advantage of these weak signals? Okay? This is a less clear thing to see. Suppose, let's say, that these guys are right and that there are these prediction signals that I can tell when it's a slightly better day and not a slightly better day. That becomes a tricky thing to take advantage of. Okay? One way I might be able to take advantage of it is by borrowing lots of money. Okay? If I have a very, very weak advantage to the days that are going to be positive. Maybe what I should do is borrow money those days and buy stocks and leverage myself up and make those trades. But it should be clear that these become risky, complicated strategies. Okay? And you've got to really know what you're doing if you're going to think about that. Any questions? And finally, you should recognize how complicated it is to evaluate these things. It may seem like an easy question to how do you design a trading strategy or evaluate whether a trading strategy works. Let's understand why it is so complicated. In one sense, you can say, what's so complicated about it? Okay, All the price data is there. If my algorithm tells me to buy or sell on a particular day, I can do that. I'll just buy on the, at the opening price and sell it, if, if, or sell at the opening price, depending upon what it says, and I'll see what would have happened. Notice that what would have happened is a hard thing to tell. One thing is, typically when you're analyzing this, people ignore transaction costs. Every time you buy or sell a stock, you implicitly pay something to the broker for it. Okay? And that's, you know, in a strategy where you're moving in and out every day, you should in principle have high transaction costs that might eat up whatever kind of a small gain you might make. If, let's say, I could make it a, uh, a half a percent gain every trade, okay, with this kind of a strategy, but I lose a half a percent in commissions every time I make that trade, I've accomplished nothing, okay? The other issue is, it is often the case that when you have this idea, wow, I see there's a great opportunity to buy today. My, uh, my algorithm says buy, and look, the price went up 50% at the opening bell. Okay? I would have made a lot of money. Recognize that quite often the prices move. And, and what's more, when you buy something, it moves. If I go and buy a billion dollars of Microsoft stock, I can guarantee the price is going to go up. Okay? But it does me no good because, well, first, you know, so. First of all, the price is going to go up if I start to buy, okay? And so I can't buy an infinite amount at the opening price. So the limits, the question of how do I take advantage of these kinds of things. Typically when you evaluate it, you don't evaluate the possibility that you can't buy it. You typically don't evaluate transaction costs. The other thing this study didn't do was worry about interest. In fact, actually there should be if you have money that is sitting and holding, okay, if you took your money out of the market, you do earn interest on it on a daily rate. And this study didn't actually test that. Okay? That probably should also be factored in. But two of them are against technical analysis. One of them would be in favor of it versus buy and hold. Any questions? Now, what would my conclusions be? You spent a, list, a semester listening to me, and you know what those conclusions are worth. Okay? But, um, but what I would say if I read this thing, I would interpret technical analysis as being a um, technique that is used by people as a justification for making what are relatively arbitrary decisions. How many people here have ever flipped a coin to decide what to do? Which class should I take? Is it Skeena's class or Golan's class? Okay, well, I'll flip a coin and decide, okay? Now that is being used as making a and it may be that if you have a good coin, it'll lead you to the right class. That is an argument that you're using some kind of a relatively arbitrary method as a justification for making decisions that are relatively arbitrary. 
truth is you couldn't lose no matter which class you took, minor golems, let's say, or something like that. The way I think about it is, you know, another thing that I think about is that um, people sometimes tend to, if you're thinking in terms of, if you're thinking about a trader sitting at a terminal, okay, they're making, the, the thing that the technical analysis does is give them some kind of formal structure to work in. It may be an arbitrary formal structure, but it is a formal structure. So um, I think of it as a similar thing like poetry. Do people here know what haiku are? I don't know if that's, I'm using this word right or it means nothing. That's a phony English word for a Japanese style of poetry, supposedly. No one's heard of that. Has anyone ever heard of a limerick? Okay, there's another English style of poetry, which usually, uh, it, um, has anybody heard of, okay, poems that you guys read, do they rhyme? Or is it completely in Chinese or any po poetry? Are there, okay, let me tell you about English poetry, which I understand a little bit. There tend to be very formal structures. Have you ever read anything from Shakespeare? He wrote in iambic pentameter. What does that mean? It's some kind of a rhythm of when the rhymes would be. And Shakespeare was a very good writer. Now, is it, you would think, would he have been a better writer if he didn't limit himself to a particular rhyme structure? Okay? The answer would seem to be, mathematically, in principle, you should be able to write better stuff if you have no constraints. Okay? But somehow poets seem to produce nice things when there are formal constraints. Okay? And that might be an argument that somehow their thinking is channeled in a particular way. And maybe this works this way for, um, for traders. And like I said, the bottom line is, if we believe that the markets are random walks, and we can't predict what's happening, any trading strategy is as good as any other one. So there's no reason why not to use the technical analysis. Any questions? No reason to use it by that argument, but no reason why not. Any questions? Okay. Bottom line, it seems to be able to identify trends that are occurring, but less compelling, they can pick up significant changes. Any questions? Any questions about technical analysis? Any questions about homework one, two? Please get on there, give it a try, and let's talk about it on Thursday. I hope to have some people who figured out some of these things by Thursday. Thanks a lot. Talk to you then.